today our guest of honor has been who uh, mr siddharth uh, dhanwant sangvi he has been compared to all time greats like salman rushdi and vikram seth when it comes to his style of writing while his father was a businessman his grandfather was a psychoanalyst and maybe that's the secret to the variety in his genes he chose to become an author of international best sellers and today we have with us mr siddharth dhanwant sanghvi siddharth has a brilliant academic background having done his ma in international journalism from university of west minister london and a second masters in mass communication from san jose state university he has incredible variety in the genres he chooses to write on uh while his first book the last song of dusk revolves around karma love and sexuality his second book the lost flamingos of bombay took inspiration from the jessica lal murder case am i right uh, siddharth yes you're absolutely spot on <laughs> and the last uh, song of dusk won the betty trask award the premio grinzane tower and was nominated for the impac prize his second book the lost flamingos of bombay was shortlisted for the man asian prize his third book the rabbit and the squirrel squirrel is a story of thwarted love today we are going to find out more about siddharth's first work of non fiction loss that talks about a very important aspect of our lives that is death siddharth talks about the loss of his parents and his pet in this stirring memoir of death and grief i look forward to the thrill promise endless possibilities of another memorable event thank you siddharth for joining us today and uh, i would like to hand it over to you to uh, speak little bit about the book your inspiration your motivation and then we uh, i would request our coordinator sonali uh, to conduct the q and a and uh, then book reading siddharth uh, how would you like to take it forward by reading or just uh, straight away with q and a Well, we'll see. We'll just hear the questions. I might pause and read uh, when there's a little uh, break in our conversation. First of all, thank you so much. You know, the fact that this is a women-led um, endeavor makes it especially special because um, women keep the wheels of publishing. Women keep the wheels of literature alive and moving forward. So the fact that you know all of you have taken this time out of your schedule to make room for this is an incredible privilege. Let me start by telling you a little about how the book came into being. In 2018, I lost my dad, and uh, I wrote an essay on what it was to to lose him, and I had sent it to um, Amitabh Bachchan, who is my neighbor and a very dear friend, with whom I sometimes share the early drafts of my work for his. feedback his thoughts you know he comes from a very profound lineage his father was a, a very great poet dr hari vansh rai bachchan mm -hmm. so i have a lot of respect for his um, literary mind in addition to his obvious acting genius which we all know about so uh, you know i often send him me you know because he's so busy he'll respond quite in a laconic way but for the first time he messaged me and i was in madrid and he said you know sudhad i want to carry this piece on my blog do you give me the permission so i said amit uncle you know it's, it's such a personal piece and i i had no intention of publishing it i just wanted you to read it you know you knew my dad it was a way of mm -hmm. honoring his uh, life so he said no please i would like very much to publish this piece and i said by all means amit uncle and what happened in the bargain was this incredible audience of readers that i had never tapped into you know which he obviously knew through his blog who wrote to me on facebook who wrote to me on other social media to tell me how moved they were and how that reminded them of their own loss you know of a parent of a child of a sibling or a pet and it made me think more deeply of how how little there is a language in india for death for grief for our loss 
And I think it's uh, perhaps because we ritualize death so much, you know, it's all about the chotha. It's about, you know, whether you've gone for the, third, you know, have you gone to somebody's home, you know, and so forth. And, and what's lost in this kind of ritualization that uh, so many of us are guilty of is that we cannot pay enough attention to this grand cosmic event that is death. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we, we're not able to look this profound life changing thing um, for the living, you know, uh, how death can transform the living. It's such a great lesson, but a lot of that is lost. So I realized that, you know, that's why people were responding because that essay had given them pause. It had been like a mirror to their own experience, to their own sadness, to their own grief. Uh, so that emboldened me and slowly, you know, this book developed over uh, two years, but the starting point was that it was just Amit uncle kind of, you know, from years and years of reading material, recognizing that, you know, there's something over here that might have uh, a larger resonance and he uh, published it. And I think the intention of writing this book was to make a community book, you know, which if I'm not able to enter your pain. If I'm not able to meaningfully somehow bring you some solace at a time of loss or grief in your life, I wanted to be able to give you this book and to say, you know, I'm so sorry. I don't know how to attend to your pain, but perhaps this book can, you know, bear witness to what it is that you're going through right now. So it was with this intention uh, that it started out, and I wanted to tell you how uh, you know it came into being in the first place. Yeah. Should we start the Q and A? Yes, sure. I, I mean, and please go ahead. I mean, I'm I'm very yeah. keen to hear questions. Yeah. From okay. So Nali, please, if you can come in. Good evening, Siddharth. Welcome to Surya Uday. Good uh, evening, Sonali. When you lose someone close, you don't just lose them. You lose a part of yourself. You lose who you were when you were with them. Mm -hmm. Loss is deeply moving, intimate, heartfelt, and brilliantly written memoir. There is hurt and pain in the writing. And it moves you. It me moves you deeply. I was overwhelmed and I literally cried while reading it. Oh, thank you. If I could, I would have hugged you to ease the devastating pain of your losses. Hmm. I would take my qu first question here and then open the floor to other members. Grief is not a record of what has been lost, but of who has been loved. In the end, we weep not only for the death of someone, but for the startling question that faces us. What shall we do with the love we have for the deceased? Where will we put it? Who now should be recipient of the gift of our hearts? These questions are deep and capture the harsh reality we have to face when someone close passes by. How do we find answers to these? And have you found for yourself answers to these questions? I think the... Um... Well, first of all, thank you so much for reading the book, Sonali, and thank you for that very heartfelt uh, introduction to the book. And also I can see, you know, you've penciled out the lines that have been very beloved to many readers of this book. So, um, so thank you so much for this gift of your time. You know, a lot of people ask me that, you know, was it a difficult book to write? you know, because I was obviously assessing the deaths of my uh, parents, I was just assessing the death of my pet. Um, and yes, you know, at the, at the time of writing it, it de definitely was, there were times when I was profoundly overcome, thinking of my parents as people, you know, other than my, other than their role in my life as, as, their, as my parents and as, you know, people who nourished me, I began to see them as individuals who had really profoundly suffered in their life. And when you look at somebody that close to you and, and you can look at their pain and their anguish and you can see, my God, this is the, this is the true nature of life, you know, that it is suffering, it is pain. Uh, and of course, there are layers of joy and layers of gratitude and beauty that can enfold us. But the Buddhist idea that life is suffering becomes very apparent when you look at the deaths of your parents, you know, and how that transforms you.
Sorry, did you say something or? Sorry, right, please go on. Oh, no, someone was. Uh, Sorry uh, for that thing. No problem. Yeah. Um, so, no, you know, so what began as a very difficult assessment, Sunali, soon became a very profound thing uh, of celebration. You know, because I could see how richly my mother had lived her pain, how profoundly she had endured it, how uh, stoic my father's loneliness uh, would have been. So what began as this sort of assessment of these deaths actually became a celebration uh, and a feast of their lives and their memories. So I was very lucky that it started out in a very dark way, but it ended in this burst of light, in this burst of awareness, in this burst of gratitude that I was uh, related to them at all. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I'll invite uh, Meghna for the next question. Uh, hi, hi Siddharth. Uh, I truly felt a plethora of emotions uh, when I read your book and I found many life lessons in it too. And there was this one line uh, you wrote towards the end of the book, which I really would like you to expand upon. Mm -hmm. uh, it says, uh, live in fragments no more. It's really beautiful. Can you speak a bit more about this particular line? Sure, you know, that's not my line. That's a quote by E.M. Foster, uh, okay. you know, and, and, I, and I credit him in, in that passage. And it talks about, uh, it's a very famous, I think, from Howard's End, which mm -hmm. he talks about where he says, um, only connect, live in fragments no more. And um, I quoted it from a friend who had gone to attend a wedding in Italy. And she was looking at these two people uniting and thinking about that phrase. And for me, I was thinking about my parents' uh, life and death connecting, you know, and how interconnected all of these spaces are. So in the same way that uh, a line like that could seem very romantic and, and poetic to, to, to a woman at a wedding, you know, um, only connect, live in fragments no more, is what you want to say to a future lover, that you know, let, let's have this profound union. But for me, the, that poetry and that romance was not there, you know, it was, uh, it had a different resonance and, and the resonance was uh, with life and death and how the two of them connect. Um, so that was my takeaway from that uh, beautiful quote by E.M. Foster uh, from Howard Z. Beautifully connected by you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So that I would, I would request you to please read from your book, Loss, sure. for our readers here. Of course. So I'm going to read a passage uh, about, um, I, I was in Jaisalmer when I lost my father and I had thought that I'll never go back there. You know, it, had a, it was a place with so much uh, shock and sadness and grief that I thought I'll never be able to go back. And of course, as you know, uh, as, as women who've lived very full bodied life, that every time we resolve something, life has a way of, you know, defeating that resolve and saying, you have to go through this. And sure enough, two years later, I had to go back to Jaisalmer. And so I'm going to read you that passage of what it felt like for me to, to uh, return to Jaisalmer, where I had been two years before, uh, at the time of my father's passing. Why I had returned to Jaisalmer, I had no idea. But what I got out of the trip is something you might know already that you will go on. My father's death was an insurmountable truth, but with time, its terror had paled to become what it was, a fact, but not the truth. On my stroll at sunset, a memory of my childhood returned. As children, after dinner, my father would insist that my sisters and I walk the long straight length of the compound in our house. To us as kids, these walks were deathly dull. And although later I would come to see walking as a way of thinking and of airing the mind. On these walks, my father told us stories. Once upon a time, he began. In a magical kingdom, they lived. You know, those early stories of animals in the jungle, of escape artists and runaway princes, of witches and dwarves for a powerful introduction to story listening. 
and a prelude to reading. The cultural historian Marina Warner discovered that in Arabic, the root for the word watering, rava, is the same as for a storyteller, ravi, and implied that narration is irrigation. My father was out every night, walking his wards, telling them stories, making sure that one day his garden would bloom. Thank you, Papa. I get that now. I get you now. I hope it's not too late. Wow. Thank you for the beautiful words. Thank you. So that's what it felt like to go back, you know, after two years and to feel very profound gratitude um, for how, uh, you know, I had been cared for. My father and I had a very complicated uh, relationship. You know, it was not an ideal father-son relationship. It was a very honest father-son relationship, which is to say it was complicated and there was often tension. Um, but to love somebody retrospectively, you know, to love somebody without the static of the relationship in existence, where you can look back and say, oh my God, you made me. These are the profound, unspeakable gifts that you have given me. And you can begin to appreciate that in and especially with the passage of time. Uh, and that's what's made me come to think of death as a, a kind of a cosmic pause between two people. You know, that sometimes when that exchange is kind of over or it, it can no longer be meaningfully lived between two people, it comes to its end, you know, its logical end. And that's what it felt like for the physical relationship, you know, I had with my dad when he was alive. But when he passed on, you know, I came to see and appreciate, and I don't know if, if you know, you feel like that or if any of you have had the misfortune of losing your parent, where you retrospectively think, oh my God, you know, like every day I count the innumerable ways that my mother has looked after me and nourished me. And, and that comes back to you in solitude and you're, and you're all alone and then it just, it hits you. You know, it's, it's not so much as grief, it is gratitude. It is this overwhelming sense of, oh my God, you have made me and you have nourished me and you have put me on this planet. <clears throat> Yes. So please, if anybody, uh, you know, has a resonance with that experience and wants to, you know, perhaps uh, share that or speak about this, please do jump in. This isn't just a Q&A. I would love to hear how others, uh, you know, are processing their loss, how they live with their grief and how they've come to places of healing. Anybody would like to come in here? Rajna, you are on mute. Yeah. Yeah, I'll come in. Hi, Siddharth. This is Rachna Todi from, uh, I'm from Nagpur. Hi, Rachna. How are you? And Siddharth Bajaj is my cousin, brother. Oh, how wonderful. Please say hello to him. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, you know, Siddharth, it's been 14 years since I lost my husband to lung cancer. I'm sorry to hear so, that. <clears throat> Yeah, and since then, I have just stopped thinking or dreaming about the future, I think, you know, I just live life each day as it comes. Mm. And uh, I think uh, there's something like that has been referred in your book also, one of your friends has mentioned that. Mm. So as I was reading the book and penning down my thoughts, there was an like outpour of emotions. And in the night, I had the most restful and peaceful sleep, you know, I had in a long time. Oh, wow. And, and today morning, I felt, you know, I had been like really soothed, you know. And wow. uh, I used to have these joint pains and ache, aches, which had really disappeared. I felt like a child, you know, full of energy in the morning. I'm so grateful to so, hear that. What a beautiful... I was just wondering, like, it... Was I really healed, you know, while reading the book? And do we ever heal? You know, I, I would never ever um, judge your experience. I would just honor it. So if you feel uh, healed, even if it's for a day or an hour yeah. or a night, that uh, experience is very valid. And what you've just done is made meaningful my solitude. You know, the fact that I live here alone in Goa and I live a very solitary, um, lonesome life. <clears throat> uh, 
um, it, it heightens me that my work has been able to bring you consolation. I'm so grateful to you, Rachna, for reading and for taking this book to your heart and, and, and allowing, because this was the intention. It was written as a community book. I want it to go almost like a bhikshu, you know, from people's home, from one home to another and say, can I read to you? Can I tell you a story that might somehow make you um, ache a little less? That's really what I wanted was to be an, an, an big show of experience, go from one home to another. And that's what this wonderful opportunity with each one of you is that you're allowing me to come into your homes and to read to you and tell you these stories and to hear your stories. So I'm so much luckier for that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rachna. Thank you, Rachna. Uh, Pooja, I would invite you next, Pooja Agarwal. Yeah, uh, hi Siddharth. I'm so happy to be here this evening, here today. And one this beautiful line that I came across this book today was, I told myself, leave. If you've enjoyed yourself, leave. Mm. Because you are still enjoying yourself, mm. leave. Because you will have to anyway. Do we really know when to leave? And it's so, it's such a big life lesson. Please throw some more light. You know, it's so uh, wonderful that you uh, point that out because it's a thing that my sisters and I would talk about because my father was 72 when he was diagnosed with brain cancer. And in seven or eight months of his treatment, he was physically perfectly fine. You know, he was back to being absolutely fit. He was able to walk, but the, the treatment, the chemotherapy had left him with cognition loss, had left him with short-term memory loss, had left him with no ability to take pleasure in his life. So it became a, a really great dichotomy that here was somebody who had healed, who had recovered. You know, at 72, his brain cancer had been wiped out. There was no trace of it. And he was back to being on the saddle, being this, you know, fit man that he had always been his life, but without the facility of his mind, you know, without his ability to engage in conversation, to talk to people that he loved and cared about, so that's when my sisters and I thought about, you know, at what point of time should we uh, begin to look at, you know, what is an exit, you know, invitation from the universe? You know, at what point of time can you hear that, you know, or what point of time are you allowed to hear that? That it says, you know, something internally says that, okay, now I'm of this age and I have lived and experienced and endured what I needed to. And is this my exit plan? That's a personal question. It, you know, it's a very, very individually decided uh, thing. Some people want to fight if I was in my father's position and I was 72 and I had lived my full life, perhaps I would have not wanted to take uh, you know, the treatment that he did. So who's to say, you know, these are all individual experiences. There's a possibility that when I'm 72, I might suddenly want to say, no, I, I love life and I want to live. I want to drink this miracle juice of existence, you know, as much more as I can. Um, I don't know, but it is a question that my sisters and I think about. And, and knowing that I'm a little chicken and knowing that I'm a little afraid of suffering, I would prefer to go sooner than later, but no one has any control on that at all. Siddharth, going back to my personal story, I lost my mother-in-law because of a, a multiple myeloma, that's a bone marrow cancer. Yeah. So we always, I always thought that if she could have stayed for some more years, mm. just as you've described in the book, that even after recovery, there was so much of suffering for 10 years for your father. So now I realize, I think that was the right time to leave. After the suffering would have been worse for her and for the family also. Well, I'm, I can see how uh, moving uh, this experience has been for you. Um, and what is really a thing that all of us can pay vigilance to at this point of time in this hour is to say that maybe, you know, we couldn't decide it for our parents' generation, but we can think about it for ourselves. And to have that conversation with our children, with the people that, you know, we we are in a relationship with and say, look, if this happens to me, I need you to make sure that I have a very clean exit. You know, if these parameters of my body fail, I need you to make sure that I'm not, you know, uh, uh, 
a vegetable in a bed. Now, the point is, all life is sacred, all life is spiritual, all life is beautiful. So who can decide that being a vegetable in a bed is any less beautiful than our life right now? It's an individual call, but it is definitely a subject to think about. So I hope that that's a question that all of you might go back and revisit in, in your own solitude. That you know, when that exit notice, that first invitation comes from the from the universe, how do you wish to respond? Thank you. Thank you. Chaitana? Yes. Hi, Siddharth. Uh, Siddharth, I love your writing. You. And uh, you said your uh, relationship with your father is complicated, but all relationships are complicated. Absolutely. What I gather from your book is that you're a wonderful son and you're a wonderful family man. So that I've suffered a loss of my own. Uh, I lost my father in an accident. One mm. moment he was there, the second he was not, and I couldn't even do his last rites. Mm. But I've healed myself through uh, spirituality. I have, uh, I've, I loved one part of your book. I always thought, Siddharth, that, you know, we mourn the loss of dear ones who loved us, cared for us, brought value to our lives, materially or emotionally. Because as human beings, we are little selfish. But the line which on page 50, it says, who now shall be the recipient of the gifts of our hearts. Mm. This set me thinking and has changed my perception. Mm. I might mourn people now, uh, people I have loved unconditionally too, mm. who have not uh, played any part in my life. I can mourn them too, yes. How beautiful, how generous of you, really. <clears throat> yeah. Um, also, uh, Siddharth, when we, when we go to mourn in people's houses or over, over the phone who've lost uh, their dear ones, what advice can we give them? I mean, I-, that I is Such an important question and I cannot thank you enough for asking it because I think that as Indians, we are possibly uh, so unknowingly insensitive to people at the time of their deaths. It is so insulting and it should not, it should be forbidden to send a WhatsApp message to somebody who has lost someone. I think it's one of the rudest, most belittling, most insulting thing. And if we have been guilty of it, we should stop doing it uh, in the future. I think the most elegant way is to send a message and say, I'm so sorry. Uh, I want to talk to you. I want to come and see you. Please tell me if that is possible and when I should do it. That is the absolute least we can do when somebody we know has died. I think this uh, culture of, uh, of abridging that uh, event into like, hey, sorry, you know, um, condolences. It's, uh, I think we had to stop it. You know, knowingly or unknowingly, people look at those messages and think, you really didn't see my mother. You really didn't see my father because you would not be sending me such casually worded, um, potentially insensitive messages uh, at this point of time. And I don't mean that, you know, even people mean to say it. I don't mean that they're doing it out of bad intent. I think that the language doesn't exist, you know, and which was one of the reasons, as I said early, early on that I wanted to write this book, that if I, if I just want to say that, you know, Rachna, I don't know how to uh, reach out to you, I don't know what to say, perhaps, you know, you can take some consolation from this book, or let me make you khichdi and kari and send to you, you know, for the next three days, just simple things like that. So I, 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 I you know, my sisters often scold me and say, you know, like, why are you so rude with people when they have, you know, sent you a WhatsApp or, you know, you've stopped seeing them. Um, it's, it's something that really bothers me. It bothers me because I feel that it not only insults me, but more importantly, it insults the memory of the deceased. So I, I believe that we should perhaps, you know, consider how we reach out to someone who's mourning. Thank you, Siddharth. Thank you. Uh, I would continue here uh, uh, for people who are close and if they lose someone we, uh, we tend to go there mm -hmm. okay but what about 
people who are not so close to us but still we feel for them and mm-hmm. what when they go through a loss what we can do then we can't obviously uh, reach out to them in the current situation like in this pandemic we can't reach out to them then what is your advice in that case um i think that particularly in a pandemic the the dignified thing would be to schedule a phone call you know just to say that i you know i want to respect that i can't come and see you but would you let me know when it's possible for you to speak you know can i have some food made and sent to you it really doesn't take uh very much to reach out uh to somebody um and even the scriptures talk about how for days together you know when the soul leaves the body when the body is dropped the soul is still hovering around and it's kind of looking at with great puzzlement at you know how people are behaving are they just sort of removing the old clothes and sort of distributing them and throwing them about what what's going on so it's not even just about the feelings of the living but also the awareness that the soul has in that time when it hasn't really necessarily crossed over into the other realm so that um, that's also something potentially to think about if you believe in such things and and you might be an atheist and and you might not and that's perfectly fine but there are many many reasons to be uh, sensitive and watchful to how we express uh, grief and i and i certainly think whatsapp or a, a text message is not the right space for doing that i think that should stop yes i think everyone would resonate to that uh, um, i will read one uh, message we have received in the chat box okay. alka karnani says this book reached me 2 days after my father's death on 15th november i'm so sorry to hear this <clears throat> what touched my heart was their laughter their conversation their presence is their best thing and mm. lives on ahead of death yeah so, okay i have another message uh, so that how could you express so beautifully and started writing at such a young age were you able to vent it out through writing you know i don't think i was able to vent it out but i was able to give shape to my life i think that language has a way of clarifying thought and of clarifying conduct um and 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 words become a a kind of a distillation for for the spirit for the being for the consciousness uh so very early on um i i began to write partly also to, you know my mother who i write about in loss was disabled she couldn't walk yeah. and one of the things that we did was um to tell her about the life beyond her own bed because she couldn't move so it was upon her children to come back to her with little stories with anecdotes with pieces of gossip uh and tell her because here was a woman who was completely disabled who couldn't move left to right who couldn't even get into her wheelchair so it was upon us to animate her life and conversely as i as i also write about is to see how she was she was served so many defeats but she was never defeated by them you know she was given like such absurd amount of pain it's a question i still think about it's a question that i wonder about how did she cope how did a woman who had lost use of her legs who had lost use of you know of being able to move even left or right in the bed you know never mind sitting up never mind getting into a wheelchair she had she was completely disabled and she always smiled she always had the most extraordinary cheerful demeanor she had a curiosity for life where did this um incredible sense of survival and of celebration of life come from that was one thing that i was constantly looking at when i was writing this book so i uh, i would like to read from your book here um from my mother i learned a writer had to immerse her mind in a world so different from her own that she might briefly forget it or mm-hmm. forgive it especially when she saw other worlds came with other cruelties mm to write has to help someone else erase some part of their pain it was as simple as that mm. your writing is very beautiful and it moves everyone um 
Chetna has written here, is pain a prerequisite for an author to write extraordinarily? <laughs> well, I don't I know. Think so it's, it's valid in your case. I'm sorry, but it is. Well, I, I don't think it's a prerequisite, but I think that it's a kind of a foundation school. I would certainly say so. Um, but you know, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, the, the South American Nobel laureate, in an interview with the Paris Review, talked about how uh, he felt happiness was essential, you know, for writing. He felt that he wanted the creature comforts, he wanted his swimming pool, he wanted to wake up, you know, in a nice bed and wake up and write. Uh, so he he said that you know. It, and unlike the romantic myth that writers have to suffer and have to be in great pain to produce beautiful work, he was like, beauty can come out of beauty. And so while it hasn't been true for my life, unfortunately, I can live in hope. Okay, uh, thank you. I will now invite uh, Sangeeta Mehta for the next question. Uh, hi, Siddharth. Hi, Sangeeta. Uh, uh, well, while reading this book, I became very emotional because mm -hmm. my father is in last stage of cancer. Mm -hmm. And anyways, I'll come back again. Sonali called Sunanda in that, is that? Uh, is Sorry, can I just say that I'm, I'm really thinking of you and I'm thinking of what you might be going through right now. And if you can somehow just focus on the profundity uh, of the relationship you have shared with your father, I feel and I'm a great believer that, uh, that love is larger than pain. And if you can always hold on to this knowledge and to this one thing, I know that it's going to pull you through in ways that you've never encountered. Pay, love always eclipses the pain. Actually, I am prepared. I'm quite prepared. But the thing is, you know, after all, of course. father is father. Of course. So that is the Life thing. Course. <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted to, um, you know, read this, this, um, Sent, uh, this beautiful sentence. A part of our, of our job while living is to remember the dead. Memory is indestructible. Well, most of the time, you think about someone, they come glowingly before, um, glowingly alive before you. Could you throw some more light on? Yes, my book is proof of that. My book is yes. proof that, you know, I wrote about my parents and to me, they're alive. In, and because yes. of this act of writing, because of this yeah. act of remembrance of them. And as I said earlier on, you know, that because relationships, when they're being lived, can be, you know, there's always a little static between two people. There's always a little tension, even amongst the people you love yeah. the most. But what happens when that person drops their form? is you begin to see them for their spirit and the soul that they were without all this junk around, without all this tension around. And then the relationship becomes even deeper and more purer because now there is no real give and take. I can't do anything for you. You can't do anything for me. We're both in different realms, but I still recognize what a special individual you are and how lucky I am to have been born of you. So that is also something that's become uh, very clear for me as time has gone by. Thank you so much. Thank really, you. really, I mean, I'm in, enjoying the book, feeling that I'm, I'm very emotional about it, but I'm getting some kind of courage also. How wonderful. This book. Thank How you. wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. So that when you mention about the Maki uh, novel, you say that some have... She's not feeling well. Some have good deaths while some have awful deaths. Doesn't it bother you? Because how do we accept the reasoning which goes inside our mind how, when a person goes away? Like in your case, your father and your mother, they experienced different deaths and your mother suffered a lot. So how do we, you know, reason in our minds? Well, it's a wonderful question for me. It's like the start of a book. You know, these two characters who are young and, and in love and married, um, 
and then you see the end of their lives. You know, in my mother's case, there was this profound suffering and, and anguish. And my father had the most elegant death, the death of a king in his sleep. Mm -hmm. How do you explain it? It's, uh, it's also something that I would discuss a lot with my mother. You know, the more sick she became, we would question this, you know, that was it her karma that had brought her to this place? Was it just random? Was it just bad luck? How do you reconcile? And of course, there was no real clear answer and there never is. What I do understand and value now is the profundity of the questioning and the profundity of that company which allowed for that questioning. Mm -hmm. You know, which is what I would probably lead into a different point that I make in loss, which is that in addition to the loss of the person, you know, in addition to the loss mm -hmm. of the child or the husband or the wife, what is also lost is the person you were for them. You know, yes. if you are a son, you are suddenly, that part of your life is finished. You know, that part of your life can never come back because that person with whom you were in, in that dance, in that relationship is no longer there. So it's not just the physical loss. It's not just the death of the, the person and the individual, but what role you inhabited in their life, you know, and the kind of person you were. You know, I'll never... Like I could call my mother at 2 a.m. after a really bad date and, and sort of, you know, tell her that, oh, this was awful and this was miserable and this was, you know, blah, blah, blah. That person is gone. You know, I, I never feel the need now any longer to share that with anyone because the person who I shared it with uh, is no longer there. That part of my life is finished. So I think that when we mourn, we, we mourn not just not the death of the person, but the person we had become around them. Yes, I think we even mourn the possibility of a relationship which could have been. Like That's in my personal case, I lost my uh, mother's brother at a young age and I was really very close to him. So, you know, at, while I was growing up, I used to imagine if he had been alive, what my relationship would have been with him. You know, That's it's all good. the possibilities and reasoning that plays in your head. Yeah. You know, if I can just take your wonderful observation and, and deepen it or add to it a little bit, is um, there's a wonderful book by Edmund White um, called Loss Within Loss. And they're a collection of essays on young artists in the 80s and 90s who died of AIDS. And he makes his observation of how when an artist dies, the two different kinds of death, not only the artist who's gone, but all the work that they could have produced you know, the songs they could have written, the paintings they could have painted, the books they could have written, the photographs they could have made, that output is also lost, you know, and that's why he called it loss within loss. So it's, it's the death of, of the artists, but also their contributions, uh, with, which, you know, we could have bettered our lives. That's also taken away from us. Yes. Um, I'll read some comments which we are receiving. Sure. Um, uh, Avina writes, I felt your mother was so full of life. I she think, was. Yes, yes, she was. The way you mentioned she was. I feel so that it was Gita that held her to be what she was. Avina continues writing this. Uh, that's true. You mentioned in the book also that uh, she was part of Bhagavad Gita satsang also. Okay. And next comment is from Anshu Sada. She says, while reading the book, I could hear the echo from my late father mm -hmm. that life is a really relay race and I need to pass on my wisdom to you so that I can live through you. Mm. How beautiful. What a lovely thought. Do the same with your children. That's a lovely deep thought. Anju. Thank is. you for sharing. Um, I'll take the next question. In an interview, you said, and I quote, a book about loss could be a sorrowful thing. Mm -hmm. But the powerful thing about language and distance is how your biggest losses can grow into your greatest solace. Mm -hmm. You just have to hang out with the pain long enough until it begins to mend you. I think so that answers a lot of our 
thoughts and what's going on with us it answers very aptly could you please talk about how writing this book helped you overcome your sorrow you know the honest truth is uh, sonali i don't think you overcome sorrow you know it's not a speed bump that you know all of us have to go over and then suddenly one day we are like oh you know now it's you know we are behind it it isn't like some kind of a mile marker on a road that you know when you go past this now you're all healed and mended and okay i'll clarify here what i mean to say here is that sometimes what happens when we mention and we immediately you know we can't stop crying But yes a time passes by then we are able to you know stop crying in front of anybody and everybody that's what i mean by us absolutely me. absolutely so you know you become as large as your pain you know your soul expands up to hold mm -hmm. that grief to hold that loss of the other person uh and so that's what happens so then you begin to keep your pain company it isn't something that makes you vulnerable it isn't something that holds you hostage is just somebody as strong as you are and it's looking you in the eye and you're looking at it in the eye and that's where we are <clears throat> but that takes time you know you have to give yourself that time yes that's true so now can i quickly also add a uh, one more thing about you know a friend of mine who lost her husband to uh to suicide told me that i should talk about this more when i'm doing interviews which is that she said that one of the most insulting things she found she was she she was a young person in her 30s her husband yeah. uh died of suicide 4 years ago she hasn't recovered but all her friends would just say oh come on you know uh, now it's been like 3 years now it's 4 years come on i'm going to set you up on a date you know now you should be over it and she said you know i i can't tell you how many numbers of people i've just blocked out of my life because they just saw me as a potential date for another person they stopped seeing me as a wife who was still missing her husband who was not prepared to move on so even with the best intentions you know as friends when you want to say to somebody that yes you know now it's time puja now it's time sonali we are not in that position to say you know we are not in that area of ownership of somebody else's grief you've got to let someone else come to you uh you have to keep that climate for that conversation to happen you have to let somebody feel easy but it's not in our job and our role and our station in life to tell somebody that now it's time to move on now you've suffered enough now i'm going to set you up on a date so she told me that you know when i talk about this i should make sure that i mention this so that if people are listening that they might perhaps give mind to this and how much pain and anguish this had given her over these years where they didn't see her that she said you know my role as a widow mm -hmm. right now in my life is something that's very important and and sacrosanct to me i don't want to go, you know surrender it by going on a date with another person and maybe i will maybe i'll change my mind you know after 5 years i'm only 35 um but she says i'm not ready right now so i hope that that's something that we bear in mind when we reach out to people uh, you know who've lived through these kinds of losses yes uh, actually uh, continuing your thought we can't put timeline on a some someone sorrow you know the hurt you can't put timeline on it mm -hmm. people go around judging and advising they don't understand how, what's the process each individual goes through a process and takes time on their own there is yes. no fixed timeline as such absolutely absolutely and we, and we just have to be respectful of that you know we yes. just have to watch because even our best intentions can land very badly in the minds and the hearts of people who are mourning yes. you know um it's a very delicate moment in somebody's life and how you present yourself is very very important at that point of time yes i'll ask the next question please um the imagery of socks and suit is remarkable in your book mm -hmm. you have beautifully referred to music and paintings in loss mm -hmm. uh, what could be what would be your writing advice to the aspiring authors in a poem to take your time you know just to be with the work 
and to serve your solitude, that is a much more profound thing than to say that I have made this work or I have written this book. Um, just to be privately available to your muse, privately available to the craft that you are trying to serve. If you can have that integrity, if you can have that silence, uh, just with, with your craft, with your words. Uh, I can't stress that enough. The most natural thing when we make something or write something or, uh, is, is our desire to share it. And I think that I've come to this place where I, uh, I take my time for that. You know, I, I present it very, very slowly and incrementally. Um, so that's a piece of advice that I would give is that, you know, don't rush out anything when you're writing uh, about pain and about uh, sadness. Give it the time it needs so that you can revisit it and clean up all the extra stuff around it. Thank you. That's valuable advice. Uh, Sonanda, would you like to come in if your network is okay? Yeah, thanks, Sonali. Okay. Yeah, Siddharth, I actually, when I read your book, it was the last three lines which you write, you know, when the shore is there, of course, I can see it, smooth white sand undulations. I swing back to the shore, wondering where my mother is. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, for me, I, uh, my mother lost her father when she was just about 15 or 16 years old. And right through our childhood, she would tell us a lot about him. And I grew up, you know, reading the letters he had written to her. He mm -hmm. was a doctor in the armed forces. So he had written these most beautiful letters to her describing all kinds of incidents because she was in a boarding school. Well, did they come and, to uh, I grew up... Pardon? Did they come on those blue aerograms, you know, that, that used to come? And yes, use... yes, those uh, inland letters, those yes, inland letters, yes. So she had, and it was all written with a good ink pen. And uh, so she used to really tell us, you know, stories about him. And right through my childhood to date, he's the one person I keep thinking, what if I could have met him? Because wow. of the way she, you know, it is the narration and storytelling, the kind of thing she's told me about him. I, he's, he's almost like there in front of me. He's very vivid. And I just feel my loss was I never got a chance to meet him as a granddaughter or in person. And somehow when I read your book, uh, you know, the way you describe the way you would walk with your father in the mm -hmm. evenings and he would tell you all stories. Mm -hmm. Or you would go to your mother and you had to narrate then, you know, what happened when you went out for a Diwali party or you met up with old relatives and who did what and who did this. And the gossip. Somehow, the gossip, you know, his letters were like that and his, um, to his daughters, to his children. And they've all grown up with such vivid memories of that man. And I just keep wondering, you know, that mm. I, what would have, uh, what have I lost by not meeting him? Mm. So somehow when I read your book, that's what came to me. Well, that's kind of what Sonali was also saying earlier on, right? About uh, wondering uh, what that relationship potentially could have been. The only thing that I would highlight in this is that, you know, the, the thing that you miss and the thing that you long for, your mother had recreated with language. You know, she had already yes. given you this profound gift of his presence, even with, with and in his absence. You know, that was her gift to you, that she was able to take that language and say, look, you know, this is what he did. This is what, how his spirit was. You know, he was such a generous man. He, you know, went out on a limb to help people that he loved. All of that brought him alive to you um, in this very, very beautiful, private, personal way. So maybe that's something that, you know, you can hold on to. So although you don't have, you know, the, the luxury of knowing the physical form, but language was this link between the generations and allows you to know him in spite of. Yes, that's true. Thank you. Uh, so that I would request you to please read one more uh, 
post an extraction from your book, please? Sure. Should I read? Um, yeah, this section, which... So I live in Goa, I live in a small village called Moira, which is like less than 5,000 people. Uh, and every evening my highlight is, uh, so I, I get up pretty early, I get up around four o'clock. I do my chanting and my praying, uh, and then I sit down to, to, to write and to read. And most of my day honestly is finished by three o'clock because I've already spent you know, 10 hours uh, working and doing you know, things that I need to do. So at four o'clock every day, I go to the beach. That's my drug, my drink, my, you know, vice. I have to go to the sea. Um, and so can I just read you this passage about my yes. evening? Yes, please. A spit of beach in Morjim, where the Chapora River enters the Arabian Sea, is concealed by a grove of pine trees. Ignored by most tourists, its isolation makes it a favorite of middle-aged Russian nudists who live in Goa six months of the year. In the distance is the fort with damaged turrets and embrasures. At its base, another beach with a temple, a quay for fishermen's boats. Bird life includes plovers, Brahmini starlings, kites. A few years ago, an 11-foot crocodile accidentally ended up here. A local had shot it on his phone while it was doing its threatening high walk after the neighborhood dogs began to bother it. On most days, I come here to swim in the estuary, where I sometimes see dolphins in the headwaters. I walk the length of the remote beach, standing against the wind, looking out at sea. The sky is icy blue without any clouds. At the age of 42, I have set aside much of my past, not through erasure, but by acceptance. When I'm swimming in the sea, as I do each evening, it is possible to go out so deep that you can no longer see the shore. I might feel marooned, helpless, or I might thrill from an overwhelming sense of abandon. A plover comes into view then a grove of pine trees. The shore is there, of course. I can see it, smooth, white sand, undulations. I swim back to this shore, wondering where my mother is. After all these years, I'm still looking for my mother. <laughs> wow, beautiful. Thank you. you know, each and every line in your book is deeply moving and it's an emotional read for all of us. And this has been a great session. I'm sure everybody has found answers. So many answers, I'm sure. I have a small request. Yes, I, I, you know, if I, you know, the book is just starting out. It's just had its birthday on Tuesday. It's only been three days old. If anybody has enjoyed it and would want to write a, a comment about it on Amazon, that would be the biggest gift that I could ask for for this book right now. So if any if anyone is inspired in this wonderful constellation of beautiful readers. And so I must thank each of you from the bottom of my heart, I must bow before the sublime divine reader that has read this book. I must do my pranams for your solitude and for honoring my uh, solitude with it. So I'm very grateful that you invited me and thank you so much for taking loss to heart. Yes. Uh, thank you, Siddharth, for writing this book and interacting with us. It's been emotional and... Uh, deeply moving, I must say again, uh, I'll invite Meghna, our vice president, to give vote of thanks, please. I'm actually like feeling too moved, uh, Siddharth, but um, I'll, tell, I'll speak about my favorite line from this book. Grief please. is not a record of what has been lost, but of who has been loved. Mm. One among the many thought-provoking lines in this beautiful book. It's been an honor, Siddharth, to have you here with us at Suryoday today. And I can assure you 
that your book has been more than a community book mm. it has struck a chord within each of us mm. it has even helped in healing some of us as you've heard from my members as they've expressed yes. your words have given us courage to deal with grief and loss in a way never experienced by us before thank you so so much sadhat for today's session i think all our members will agree that this was one of the most intense and therapeutic sessions we've ever had at suryo there we wish you all the best for the future and look forward to many many more wonderful books from you thank you so much sadhat thank you to each one of you i'm so grateful to you for your time and for reading loss thank you 1 million times